As the rainy season returns, the shallow bowl that was dusty Llanos is now filled with water. Those few that survived the death pools have been reprieved. A new stream of life washes in from the rivers and fans out into reclaimed territory. Life explodes in the Llanos as hundreds upon hundreds of species of birds return to their nesting grounds. Herons and storks brood in nests that overhang the water. Below, a congregation of caiman and piranha wait for the inevitable clumsy chick to fall out of the nest. This young bird was nearly fully grown and ready to fly. By some misadventure, however, it fell into the water and was devoured immediately by the piranha. The same birds that fed upon the hapless piranha a few months ago now give up their young to them. So the ledger balances as prey once again becomes predator. In parts of the Llanos, the capybara, the largest member of the rodent family, has been making a dramatic comeback. A fully grown capybara male can weigh as much as 150 pounds. Savored by Venezuelans for their tender, flavorful meat, the capybara was hunted relentlessly for over a hundred years, until their numbers had dropped dangerously low. Now, protected by the state, capybara herds are restoring their rightful place in the Llanos in spite of widespread poaching. Capybaras live in family groups of up to 40 individuals. Each family group is headed by a patriarchal male who spends most of his time fending off challenges from younger males who want to lay claim to his harem. The females and their young spend much of their time either on land basking in the early morning sun or in the water grazing on water plants. Eternally vigilant, they must watch out for the caiman that glides silently in their midst. Here survival depends upon alertness. Carelessness, even for a second, can spell disaster. This female probably lost her leg in a near fatal encounter with a caiman. Her experience has heightened her alertness to the hidden dangers in the water. But it is too late for another capybara, who turned out to be far less fortunate. The capybara lives on the margins between two dangerous worlds. In the water, it can become prey to caiman and piranha. And on land, it is susceptible to the gun of poachers and other predators such as the vulture. Vultures commonly prey on unprotected capybara young by pecking out their eyes. The shock of such a trauma inevitably leads to death, and the vultures need only to wait until their meal is ready.
Nearby, capybaras watch as the vultures squabble over possession of the dead baby. In a few hours, little will remain except for a few scattered bones. Not far away, a large satellite male has a gaping infected wound on his shoulder. The capybara has thick skin, which is normally its defense against crocodiles and piranha. But open wounds such as this are invitations to disaster. The smell of infection is already in the air, and it has not gone unnoticed. The omnipresent vulture is an eternally vigilant bird and its presence is an indicator of death. Vultures fill the same niche on land as the piranha does in the water. They are nature's cleanup crew. Vultures have a keen sense of smell and hearing. Any disturbance in the natural flow of life is magnetic to them, and they appear almost supernaturally at the first sign of weakness or sickness. This capybara is within hours of death. The vultures are patient. If the capybara should die on land, his body will belong to the vultures and other land scavengers, such as this caricare. Much to the chagrin of the vultures, the male takes refuge in the water to escape the fierce heat that is compounded by his infection. The cooler water has a soothing effect, and for the moment he feels better. Below, however, the Caribes have already scented his blood. By mid-afternoon, the male has died. The smell of his death has already permeated the water, and fish have begun to swarm around his body. Unremitting and unrestrained, the feeding frenzy begins. First, the piranha eat their way through the wound. Within seconds, they excise a portion of the shoulder, allowing them to invade the body cavity, where first they attack the organs and then the musculature. Above, the dead capybara trembles as the piranha work their way through the rest of his shoulder and up into his neck. A second species of piranha, the silver Cerasalmus irritans, also shows up for the feast. Within minutes, these six-inch piranhas will reduce a 130-pound capybara to a few pounds of skin and bones. Three days later, the winds of the savannah blow the remains of the male capybara ashore. The piranha we know comes from the tales told by great white explorers who ventured into the Amazon in search of adventure and immortality. Men like Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th President of the United States, who described the killer fish as a swirling pestilence, feared by all who trespassed upon their domain. During his expedition to Brazil in 1914, Roosevelt wrote in his diary, Piranha are the most ferocious fish in the world. They will snap off a hand incautiously trailed in the water. They mutilate swimmers. They will rend and devour alive any wounded man or beast. For blood in the water excites them to madness. The rabid, furious snap of their jaws drives their 